best in daughters, sisters, and wives. They're gonna change our lives. Big women, big girls. They'll make a better world. Invest in her. And now here's your host, Catherine Gray. Welcome to this week's episode of Invest in Her. I'm your host, Catherine Gray, the founder of She Angel Investors and co-founder of the She Angels Foundation, both designed to fund women. And that's why I'm super excited to talk to our guest today, who is a co-founder of the Operator Collective venture capital firm that is comprised mostly of women and people of color. What an anomaly. I'm excited to talk with the co-founder, Layla Seika. Hi, Layla. How are you? I'm great, Catherine. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Ah, oh, me too. Um, you know, I'm in this space and I'm always uh, talking about how we need more uh, women in the angel investing area and in the venture capital arena. And you, what you're doing is groundbreaking. So I'm super excited to talk about the Operator Collective, what you're doing with it, how it's helping people, especially women. Um, but first, I always like to get to know the guest a little bit. And you had just shared with me that you were born in Oakland, California. I was, yes. Her, Kaiser her Hospital, $99 baby from soup to nuts. That was like, my parents didn't have a lot of money, so they were pretty fired up about that, but yeah. Yeah, wow. So how interesting the path that you've uh, taken. Um, and you uh, did some boarding school on the East Coast and then ended up uh, doing um, Peace Corps over in West Africa. Tell me about that and how has that impacted what you're doing today? Um, yeah, so after college, I went into the Peace Corps. I served in Mali, West Africa. I was a small business advisor. So really, I sort of helped people figure out how to save money and then eventually had some success with a women's group. Surprise, surprise. Um, we sort of put together a catering uh, uh, company and we lived on the train line. So we sold the food um, and we made some money. We became a nationalized bank. It was actually like a big success story. So yeah, I mean, Peace Corps shaped everything about who I am. It's where I met my husband. He was also a Peace Corps volunteer, same time. Um, it was the first time in my life I'd been the, you know, the only white person for a really miles. I'd never really experienced that before. Um, it was the first person at time I'd lived in a country that wasn't America, you know, so that was all, and that was such a different version of a country. So I'd say that Peace Corps affected everything I do. And, you know, I'm so sad it got turned off with coronavirus. I hope it gets turned back on. Um, right. It's just such an important program for our country and the world. Absolutely. And uh, I really applaud you for doing that because not everybody could venture out of the country into, like you said, a place where they're the only white person. And, you know, just uh, what an extraordinary experience. I'm glad that it impacted you in the way that uh, I'm sure it's influenced the work you're doing today. And um, let's talk about your path to starting this new venture capital fund. You know, it's, um, I think it's a, it's a thing a, a lot of people dream of is creating a venture capital fund. And then also there's listeners out there that don't even know what a venture capital fund is. So I think we should start with that. What, what is a venture capital fund? Let's explain that to the audience first. Sure. So a venture capital fund is a group of people or a partnership. I'm in a partnership with my partner, Malin Yen. She actually started Operator Collective. I joined her. Um, but uh, it, 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 you basically, a, a group of people come together and say, we're going to invest money. Um, and then they go around and they ask people, which are called limited partners, hey, will you give me some money? Because I'm going to create a fund and we're going to make it this big and we're going to invest in this thesis. And, and, and you, know, you become a limited partner with me and then I'm going to go invest your money and all the rest of this fund's money and we're going to hopefully make a big return. And, and, and that's essentially how venture capital funds work. When they become a limited partner, are they considered an angel investor? I mean, look, that's how people want to define themselves. A limited partner, it's not exactly an angel investor. An angel investor tends to be someone that's doing a direct investment right. from their capital into a company. Um, so, you know, I'm an angel investor in customer, which I am, right? So, so that's uh, that was my own money directly in. I think that other people, um, 
you know, I, I think with this, you're a limited partner. So you and a group of other people have given an amount of money to a group of people that are investing it on your behalf. Um, I think most venture funds in the past have had a fairly um, sort of hands-off approach to their limited partners. That is not the approach we have at Operator Collective. We, we actually engage our limited partners very aggressively in the investment cycle in support of the portfolio. So that's sort of what's the special thing that we're doing that's different. I love that. And um, being a limited partner, so they put their money into this fund and then collectively decide who's, who, who's going to receive that money. What ventures are going to receive that money? Well, so they, they gave it to me and Malin. So me and Malin run the venture fund and we do all the investing. Now we have an investment committee um, made up of Dan Scheinman, who was the first investor in Zoom and Magdalena Yatsil, who was the first investor in Salesforce. So, you know, it's a, it's a formal for-profit fund. Like Malin and I are in it to make money. That's what we're doing here. And um, what happened with our LPs is they invested their money in our fund. And then we're out, you know, investing in companies on their behalf. Right. Funds and tend LPs to return... You know, and LPs is, uh, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, no, no. LPs is limited partners, just for everybody not knowing the jargon. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah. So, you know, funds tend to return between five and seven, five and 10 years. It just depends on what the um, investors are investing in. So, yeah. So that's what a venture fund is. And that's what, um, what we set out to create. And that's what we ended up doing. I love that. And I want to talk about who comprises that. But first, I want to talk about how this fund got started. So you had a super successful run at Salesforce, correct? And tell me a little bit about how you got involved in Salesforce. I know while at Salesforce, you did some work to create uh, pay equity for women. You championed that and actually won that women, some of the women there got paid more money because of what you did, which is no wonder that you and I were just on the Lily Ledbetter movie Zoom the other day with Lily Ledbetter, uh, who of course uh, helped enact the uh, Lily Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. So no, no surprise that you're involved in that project as well. Uh, so tell me a little bit about being at Salesforce and why your experience there drove you to then start this Operators Collective. Sure. So I worked at Salesforce for about 11 and a half years. I built the app exchange there with a host of other people, of course, um, which is like Salesforce's app store. So all the app, all the products that sit around Salesforce and make it better and easier to use and all that, I sort of figured out how to put that community and, and ecosystem together. I also ran a number of other products there, um, uh, product executive GM. So you sort of run the business and the product. Um, what you were noting is, yes, about six, seven years ago, I can't remember, um, my friend Cindy Robbins uh, and I were both promoted um, around the same time. There was an effort inside the company to look for um, executive female talent that wasn't necessarily getting raised up into the executive ranks, which was Mark Benioff's objective at that point. So we both were promoted into new roles. And as we did that, um, I really brought up pay equity and Cindy and I started talking a lot about it. it had been, I grew up in product, so I'd always been the only woman. And I could just kind of tell like from the get-go, even way before Salesforce, like something was slightly rotten in Denmark. Like, nah, wow, you guys spent a lot of money on things that I would never spend money on. Like, you know, so, um, so Cindy and I worked on it. We came up with a plan. We ultimately went to Mark Benioff, our boss, and we said, um, we don't think the women are being paid the same as the men. And he was like, oh, that's not possible. That's not the kind of company I built. I mean, it isn't, you know, he's the first person that ever built a, a software company with a nonprofit sitting right next to it and encouraged its employees to donate their time. So he was very true to that point. But um, we said, we want to take a look. And, and, and we said, you know, Cindy said very bravely, like, if we take a look and we find a problem, we have to fix it. Like, you can't just shut the hood and act like this didn't happen. Um, and he said, yeah, go ahead, take a look. And so we, we did that. Cindy took the lead on that, obviously, because I was not in HR. Um, but we put together that plan and then that that really started what became the equal pay movement that sort of raced through tech and then and then extended into corporate America. And of course, is how we met Lily Ledbetter at the anniversary of her bill being signed at the White House with Mark. So um, yeah, we're very excited about the movie about Lily and that that story coming to light for more people. Yeah, I'm super excited about that. That is a story that is long overdue and needing to be told, especially right now. And I love you telling that story so that I hope you inspire other women at companies to ask their bosses to look under the hood because it's true. Uh, 
it's still a disparity. You know, you, we both know we get paid uh, 81 cents on the dollar still and uh, women of color, 50 to 60 cents. So, so wrong, so wrong for the same job, probably being done better, just saying. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I hope that uh, makes somebody listening today, you know, go have that conversation with their boss, you know, be bold. Uh, I mean, this is a huge company. Everybody knows Salesforce. And I love that you were fearless. Uh, but I understand, you know, you do have to have uh, an owner like that, that is willing to listen and look under the hood. But uh, nonetheless, thank you for pushing the envelope. Um, so you left there and you guys decided to start Operators Collective. Let's explain to people what that means, Operator Collective. So everyone involved in this was an operator at a major company like Salesforce, correct? Like, give us some example about that. Yep. So Malin started it. I, I, you know, she, we had all sort of come to the same conclusion across a lot of the top female executives in Silicon Valley that venture capital was not very diverse. <laughs> Hello. Just, I'll be polite and say it like that. Yeah. Um, and so let's, Mal- let's remind everybody that we still get less than two or 3% of all venture capital funding and that that needs to change. And that thank goodness, things like Operator Collective are moving in that direction. Yeah, so so what we really put together, with Mal- so Malin started the fund, um, we'd all come to the same conclusion. I was leaving Salesforce, I was an LP. I joined immediately when I heard what she was doing. I'd been waiting for someone to do this. Um, and she really came up with what, what we put together is a whole new way of thinking about venture capital. like. Um, just a whole new model for the for the way people can sort of think about how to investing and getting comfortable with investing. So um, we joined forces. You know, Malin's a Malin's fabulous. She's brilliant, and and for some, you know, sometimes you meet someone and the partnership just seals so nicely. We sort of call each other Laverne and Shirley, which I know most young people are like, what are they talking about? But um, we also are very different people. And and, and for some wait, reason, wait, wait, my my co-founder at She Angels Foundation, we call ourselves Lucy and Ethel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I get it. <laughs> yeah, famous female partnerships are good things to have as as <laughs> as iconic things to hold forth. But yeah, so Malin and I are just a very good pair. So we came together. Um, the fund has over 130, as you mentioned, uh, operating executives. You know, people from Stripe, people from Salesforce, people from Slack, people from the NBA, people from um, I'm trying to think of other companies. There are so many of them. It's and 90 percent. Like- are women ninety percent are women and forty percent are people of color. Um, twenty percent are people that weren't born in the United States. So the idea was that w- what we'd all come to is if we can change who's investing in the companies, we can change the kinds of companies that are being built. Like we can build the kind of companies that we want to refer our friends to, that we feel comfortable with our children working at companies that were, you know, that looked like the society we lived in, companies that were solving hard problems that we ourselves had faced for the last 20 years in our technical careers, right? Um, so so it, it was really, and, and this just hadn't been done before, right? It hadn't been done at this scale before nor had sort of everyone been aligned in the same way. So the fund is- I, I wanna up. mention in your first year, you all raised $50 million. Yeah. But like, like, this is not a small <laughs> fund. This is like major. I just wanna- Throw that in there. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, so it's a $50 million fund. We focused only on enterprise B2B. Um, I built the app exchange at Salesforce. Mellon scaled Saster, which is the largest enterprise SaaS event, you know, outside of a software company ever. So we both have been watching enterprise SaaS nonstop for over the last 20 years, and we have some pretty decent pattern recognition. So, you know, and, and we have this army of operating LPs that help us, right? They help us look at companies, they help us think about companies, they help us diligence companies. So we really are very lucky in that regard. Um, and, and also we have a fabulous portfolio, right? We worked really hard. Um, we, we've, been, we've been very, very busy and we found some great companies and some amazing founders that are really tackling rough problems in the enterprise. I mean, not, that, not the type of thing that affects the daily consumer. We build business to business, but really complicated developer productivity problems, sales productivity problems, insurance tech, Mellon's sort of a genius at insurance. Like we're sort of going at all these different problems that we ourselves and all of our operator LPs have faced throughout our career and finding great entrepreneurs that are looking at really innovative ways of solving these problems and investing in them and helping them grow. So 
Look, it's uh, super rewarding. I mean, I can't believe oh, this is. Bad. I can't even imagine how rewarding that's got to be. You're changing the landscape. You get to invest in really cool companies, see them grow, help them grow. And one thing that you mentioned earlier to me, and I am so on board with what you said, I actually said this in a TED talk I did called Fund Women Save the World, is that the reason we need more female investors is people tend to invest in people they identify with. So if it's all white men sitting at the table and you come up with this great idea, but you're a woman that they don't identify either with you or with the product, it's not going to happen. And so there's got to be more angel investors who are women uh, and more women in the VC world. And that's why I love what you're doing because you're your group is 90% women. I mean, this is incredible. This is exactly what we need is more venture capital firms like this and more individual angel investors who are women. And um, I hope someone listening says, oh my God, I could become an angel investor. Hadn't thought of that. Let me seek out how to learn it um, because that is the game changer. And that is really what is going to level the playing field so that we stop getting less than two or 3% of venture capital, but get the 50% that we deserve or more. <laughs> um, and, um, and so I, I do hope this platform encourages people to look into becoming uh, an angel investor, especially as a woman. Of course, we want men to invest in women, but I always say, how's that been working for us? So let, let's get women to step up to the plate. We now uh, have a um, we impact more than uh, 30% of all the wealth in the world, which is trillions of dollars. We have the money at our disposal to do that. You are proof of that by putting together a group of 90% women who raised $50 million. Hello. Um, so what are some of the companies that you have invested in that you could tell us some success stories? Sure. So we invested early in a company called Set Sail. It does um, like really real time sales, sort of compensation and behavior management, helping sales uh, executives and AEs sort of figure out what to do next and do it well, and not just sort of automatically tick the next thing off the list in a really intuitive way. And they've just done really well. You know, their customers, um, like Dropbox, Lyft, Cisco, like so, just really helping big companies solve real problems. I mean, going after thinking about those problems with the companies in new ways. That's always what gets me going the most is, is when, and you know, I had a great uh, front row seat on the app exchange watching people come after business problem after business problem after business problem. But the new way of thinking about it, oh, we've been looking at it the wrong way the whole time, flip it and look at it this way. And then all of a sudden it looks completely different and you get a whole new insight into how to run the business. So, so we, you know, set sales one like that. Cube is another one, female CEO out of New York. It's EPM software. So really running finance teams the way with spreadsheets, you know, a lot of financial systems divorce you from the spreadsheet. Um, and, and that's not the way business leaders like myself, GMs work. We work in spreadsheets, right? That's where like we do all our work. So a system that sort of embraces a spreadsheet, but brings that collaborative sort of planning from a finance perspective together. So Cube's another one we're really excited about. I mean, the list goes on and on. You sure, know, I'm sure. But that's just a great lucky highlights. Place. We're in a lucky place where we just got so many great founders and, and, and all of them, you know, COVID, this was a rough year. Like this was a hard year for everyone. Like no one escaped getting a little worked this year. Um, and, and it was rough, right? But I will say some, you know, the, like flowers bloom in the middle of the war zone too, right? Um, I have seen some people doing some crazy innovation and coming up with some really cool ideas because all of a sudden, a lot of the things that stopped people from doing that, like, oh no, we gotta be in the office or we have to have this server here. We have to do this thing here. A lot of those sacred cows have been disrupted with um, COVID sort of knocking all of us into a new way of living and working. So, so it's a really exciting time to be an enterprise software. I mean, I've always liked enterprise software, but for me, this is like a renaissance moment in enterprise software. So if somebody's listening and you're talking about you all invest in enterprise software and, and B2B, uh, what kind of uh, person out there that might have a company might come to Operator Collective to look for funding? Who, who would be your dream submission? Well, really everyone on our fund list. I mean, is the, I think the best way to sort of get to know us is to look at who we've invested in before. And again, we are a very transparent firm. Like we talk about everyone we're engaged with. We're not, um, that's part of the new model that we put together. Um, 
So, you know, look at who we funded in the past. They're all, it, it's really easy to learn about those companies, even the private ones, everyone's got pressed. Um, and, and, you know, r- roughly enterprise B2B, um, some revenue is good, product market fit is critical. Um, also, can we help you, right? Like, are, are you someone we like, sometimes I meet someone and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can help you so much. We have to figure out how to work together because I know exactly what's about to happen to you. And Malin is the same thing. Right? We're like, oh my gosh, we can help this person so much. And when we get that tingly feeling and we both are like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you know, we want to invest. And often um, it's reciprocated by the founder, right? You don't get that feeling unless the other person feels it too, right? Um, so so you know, we, a lot of it just comes down to all of those types of things, but we do have a thesis. And so you know, we never do consumer. It's just not really who we are. Um, it's not where we grew up. It's not what we've spent our careers doing. Um, but anyone, you know, we're, we're open to talking to people and hearing what they're doing and sort of also trying to connect people to other people. A lot of VC is, you know, it's like the junior high school playground, like who knows who and who can connect who to who and who's at the snack bar and who's at the gym. And, you know, like you can sort of, um, there's a way. And so we're always happy to try to help people find other people that it might make more sense for based on their thesis, which might be slightly right. different than ours. And I do think uh, a lot of people would like to, uh, you know, get involved in how did they get funding for VC? Uh, what holds them back is, you know, they're a business person with an idea. They don't, uh, you know, maybe a successful company, they want to scale it, but they, they don't know who to reach out to. And like you're saying, different VCs have different niches. And so what you're saying is the best way is to go to their website and see who else they've invested in. And if it's similar to your company, then that would be a good fit. So, uh, well, and then like follow them on Twitter. I mean, right. VCs like Twitter. I like Twitter, like go follow them on Twitter, get to know if there's someone you are interested in doing. You would be, these people are in your company. Like they don't just disappear, right? Like they sit on your boards, they do board advisory roles. Like, so, I mean, do you want to spend time with this person? Is this someone you want in your company? It's it's a founder's market a lot these days. Founders get to decide who they want on their cap table more than they have potentially in the past. So, you know, there's lots that goes into it, but also as someone who's interested in investing, you can do research online from your, you know, your office, wherever you're sitting, and you can find a lot of information out about people and get to know them. Right, and, but you know what I'm saying? Like maybe they're good at running their business. They had their idea but they're not good at seeking funding. They don't know how to pitch. They don't know where to begin. And that's really what I'm trying to uh, make this a platform for. How do people learn about that? You know, um, and, and I see that there are more and more platforms out there where you can literally sign up for a workshop to learn more about. I think there's lots of stuff. I mean, look, you can sign up for our newsletter at Operator Collective. I would sign up at All Rays. I would sign up at Black VC. I mean, these are organizations that are open to everyone. That a lot of what they're going for is trying to help educate people about venture, right? I love All that. All the people on Twitter they are interesting that you've heard about as investors. See what they're talking about. Um, people, you know, people give you a lot of information if you just go look. Um, but yeah, uh, they want to yeah, help. It. It's it, we're, our objective at, at Operator Collective has always been to make it more accessible. So, you know, even just get our newsletter and you'll learn a lot about more about sort of how we view the world. If that is helpful for you, Greg. Yes. And um, they can follow you on uh, Operator Collect at Twitter. Yep. And they can go to OperatorCollective.com and uh, sign up for your newsletter, as you said. And um, yeah, I really appreciate you sharing this information. What you're doing is just groundbreaking and wonderful. I hope we see more VC companies out there like yours, but you guys are definitely leading the way. It's very exciting. Um, Thank you so much for taking the time. I want to remind everybody to become an angel investor or a limited partner in a venture capital firm. Remember to invest in her. Make it a great week. Thank you so much, Layla, for being here with us. Have a great Thanks, day. Thanks, Catherine. Appreciate it. Our theme music was created and produced by Lindsay Tomasic.